Um, so my name is Bob Beeler. I'm with uh, Bear Crop Science. I've uh, been with them almost 30 years. I've uh, been very blessed to enjoy a, a wonderful career there. What I hope to talk to you about today is, is give you some background on the corn breeding program at Bear Crop Science. And I'm gonna go back in time a little bit because you know, in, in breeding, the decisions you make 10 years ago are the ones that are actually gonna, going to, uh, you're gonna experience 10 years later. So you'll hear me, I'll talk about several people, kind of one of the themes of my talk today, I'm gonna to talk about Dr. Norman Borlaug. So how many people are familiar with Dr. Borlaug? Yep, one of the, um, may still be the only person who won a Nobel Peace Prize for his contributions to agriculture. Um, he was a plant breeder, plant pathologist by training, and uh, was the inspiration for many, many of us. So I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about Dr. Borlaug, and then uh, talk about Ted Crosby. Any of you know Ted Crosby, late Ted Crosby? So uh, Ted was my boss for a while and was really the driving force behind uh, corn breeding at Monsanto. And some of the, the hybrids that were popping out now that are performing as well as they are, we have to go back and look to some of the decisions, not just Ted, but some of the decisions Ted drove that really put us at a place where we are now, where we can really keep putting out new and better hybrids every year that have all those characteristics um, that, that you folks need. So um, this year, I know you guys had a tough spring, we did as well, so uh, just as one example, we have a, a farm in Northwest Ohio. They finally were able to plant corn on June 15th, uh, which is a tad late, and after wet, 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 and then after June 15th, no rain for six weeks. Okay, so you guys have ex probably experienced something similar, but you know, we've had the flood. Uh, now we're, you know, in some areas in very, very bad need of rain. Um, you know, back to Northwest Ohio example, three million acres in Ohio were prevent plant. You get up in the Northwest corner, uh, you know, half of, the, half of the acreage is actually, is actually planted. So the hail for a lot of areas hasn't come yet, but in a year like this, you know, it makes me worry about 10 plagues of Egypt and every once in a while I'll look up at the sky and see if the locusts are coming. Um, but it's been a very, very rough year. Um, and reminds me of one of my favorite quotes by Mark Twain. Everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. So largely true. And in agriculture, we love to talk about the weather. So we can't do anything about the weather, but what we can do is make sure in a breeding program that we have the right germplasm uh, that, we're, that we're making our crosses with, and then we test them in the right environments to hopefully uh, make sure that the material you're growing this year, even though last year didn't, didn't look like this year, that that material will still perform. Uh, one of the things uh, Dr. Crosby always said was the breeding's one of those few professions where you're always trying to predict the future by looking in your rear view mirror. So that's what breeders do. You, we look back in our rear view mirror, try to understand what performance was in previous years, predict that following year, which you know, given the difference in every year, it's a, it's a sound strategy, but one uh, with limitations, depending on what you're gonna experience in any given year. This, uh, on this side, I'll talk a, a bit about some of the foundational work that Dr. Borlaug did, and then tie it into what Bear Crop Science does, and really, you know, in some things, the, the, the changes that we've seen in agriculture over the last 30 or 40 years have been amazing. And in other ways, it's still the same stuff, right? So the fundamentals haven't really changed, but a lot of the tools that are available to us have. And what Dr. Borlaug did, he started with, his basic challenge was to develop uh, high yielding wheat varieties for Mexico. And there were people in, you know, back in the 40s and 50s after World War II who were literally starving because they couldn't produce enough wheat. One of the limitations on wheat production at the time was, was rust. So the wheat was attacked by basically three different types of rust that occurred throughout the life cycle, just as you guys battle southern rust here and then also common rust as well. Uh, but what Dr. Borlaug did was he made sure that he gathered in diverse germplasm from all over the world to look at rather than sticking with kind of a narrow group. And he made thousands and thousands of crosses, way beyond the scale of anything that anybody thought made sense. Breeding is all about numbers. Basically, big numbers wins, because what you're trying to do is find the proverbial needle in the haystack. You gotta start big and keep big throughout. Uh, so Dr. Borlaug did that and successfully um, developed uh, tolerance to all those, various, um, all those various rust diseases for wheat, literally helped feed the world, which is, what, you know, which is why a lot of us do what we do. The other thing that he did 
Um, well, the, the same, we're doing the same thing at Bear Crop Science, and I'll talk about the germplasm piece. The other thing Dr. Borlaug did that was outside the box thinking at the time was he did what he called shuttle breeding. So he was really kind of targeting one key area in Mexico, but he would test material, you know, during a six month period in a high altitude, uh, cooler environment. And then he would go, then he would in that same year go test in a hotter environment at lower altitudes. And he would select material in both environments, which kind of violated a basic plant breeding principle. You only select in the environment you want, but he did both. And the result of that was the material he selected basically worked everywhere. So he was targeting Mexico, but the, big, the reason he won the Nobel Prize was largely driven by the application of that in Asia. So it, the, the material moved, and it was partly because what he did was he tested in diverse environments. That's the same thing we try to do. So we can't just test in prairie soils in Iowa, in northern Illinois, and expect to bring them to southern Indiana or southern Ohio and that they're going to do okay. So those same principles apply. Um, the, other, the other thing that he did, and I'll, I'll tie this into what we're doing in corn breeding, the other big advancement he made was to develop short stature wheat. So one of the reasons wheat wasn't yielding well was just lodging, right? People would get good yields, the wheat was too tall, would lodge, you couldn't harvest it. So he developed short stature wheat, which didn't necessarily increase yield per se, but it increased harvestable yield. And we're working on a similar program within Bear Crop Science to actually look at short stature corn, which has a lot of the same advantages of that short stature wheat. The other thing that's the same, you know, back in the, in the 50s and 60s when Dr. Borlaug was doing it, he was a plant breeding and plant pathologist by training. And he um, worked with other plant breeders and plant pathologists, people with a vision. And he worked with agronomists, uh, people who understood statistics. And basically that team of scientists is what really drove it. We're doing the same thing. Even just plant breeders now within uh, the bear crop science corn breeding, we have corn breeders, some who focus entirely on a very early pipeline looking for new diverse sources of disease resistance or stress tolerance, others who are gonna do the early stages of inbred development, others later stage inbred development, making some of those first crosses, and then, people, and then corn breeders who are focused on actually the commercial side and what do they do when you get them in the field. In addition to not just multiple types of breeders, data science has exploded. You've seen that theme throughout the day. The same thing is true within breeding. Um, you know, much molecular geneticists now, kind of everyday part of the breeding program, biochemists, uh, climate, climate science as well. Plant pathology continues to be a driving force. We've got a, a, a large number of, of plant pathology experts within, and then agronomy is still the foundation. So those teams still exist, and that's really what will drive or not drive um, a success of a breeding program. So a lot of it's still the same. One thing that's vastly different is just the scale. Just the sheer numbers that we can now cross, the sheer numbers we can test, and the accuracy in which we do that. So this will talk about kind of three of the, of the pillars of a, of a breeding program. And I talked about this with the wheat, same thing for corn. We need to test the hybrids that you folks are gonna grow multiple years in multiple environments. Because what you experience here this year isn't gonna be what you're gonna experience next year. So if we can test something, maybe we learned something from Southern Illinois last year that applies uh, the following year. But testing in diverse conditions is absolutely key. Most plant breeders, what we wanna do is go find a uniform field, right? I wanna pick the best hybrid or variety. I'm gonna find the most uniform field. I'm gonna pick the best one. Well, that's great if you end up planting it in the best field, but the reality is you're gonna get out here you know, in, in the real world and people are gonna put it on sands or on real gravelly soil or heavy soils or whatever. So testing in diverse conditions year in, year out, and the number of locations that we can test will drive our success. Data is, is a big part of it now. So a big piece of the data that, that we'll, they're really, I would, at least the way I think about it, kind of two major components of the data. One is the genetic data. So with all the markers that we can now apply, uh, we have much more knowledge about the individual genes that will contribute to specific traits that you care about. So a corn plant has 30 to 32,000 genes within that corn plant, and some of the genes in one hybrid are different than the genes in another hybrid. And you have to know, if you're gonna cross them, what are the associated genes within that they are gonna make it yield more? What are the ones that maybe give you more disease tolerance? Which ones are gonna increase standability? Well now, because of the ability to put as many markers as we can on it and tie those specific segments of a, of a chromosome to a gene that leads to a trait, 
you can select earlier and earlier. As an example, if we know we want to produce hybrids for southern Indiana that are resistant to southern rust, you can make crosses, get the, the direct progeny off that cross, take a, a chip off of that kernel, find out if it has the disease resistance for rust or not, move that kernel forward, plant it in a field, take all the ones that have southern rust, move them over here to testing. The other ones, you know what, if it doesn't have southern rust, we don't wanna, we're not moving it forward, take those out. Well, the pile you just created over here that you test, then you can start testing for yield and other characteristics. You've already gotten rid of the ones that you don't want. Now, that's a, it's an oversimplified example because we're not gonna just throw away all the stuff that doesn't have southern rust. But you can select earlier, which means when you get it to the field, You've got more of what you know you have to have, and instead of testing 10,000 lines that you maybe throw 9,000 of them out because they don't have the right stress tolerance or disease tolerance, you know you've got that, and then you can focus more on yield. Uh, more insightful data, better planting equipment, the same things that you folks have, better planting equipment, better harvesting equipment, even seed packaging has, has uh, greatly changed for us over the years and allows us to do things at, at a scale and with the accuracy that we need. The other part, which I think is a big theme for the day, is the integrated acre testing. So you folks don't only want to know, is it a really, really good hybrid? You want to know, I bought this hybrid. It's got these characteristics. What population should I plant on my farm? So now the testing that we do, you have to start zeroing in on population. We have to have a better understanding of nitrogen impact on that hybrid. We have to know, have a better idea of how it's going to respond to fungicide. So the testing is not just on hybrids in some generic agronomic environment. The testing has to be done with variables that are the same variables that, that you folks deal with on a daily basis. So that when we test it, we can test it in all those, not just different environments, di but different environments with different agronomic inputs and then differenti differentiate the hybrids based on that. And then also use that information to um, help you manage the hybrid once you actually have it. So more diverse conditions better data, more insightful data, integrated acre testing are some of the pillars of what we move forward. So why, why does that matter? It matters because that results in a product that you're either happy with or you're not. I'm only gonna talk about two specific hybrids and they're just examples. Um, there are a whole host of other hybrids that are going to be uh, coming behind it. One of the reasons I love plant breeding is it's one of those areas where you know you always see new and improved, right? New Coke wasn't actually better than old Coke. That's why they still have classic Coke. But plant breeding, when it comes out, if it does, if it's not better in some characteristics, it, it, it's just it's not going to get advanced. So there really is continuous improvement. But the results of some of the basic things that were done within the Bear Crop Science Breeding Program, getting diverse germplasm sources. So when Ted was in charge, it, you know we had a very strong U.S. program. He went out and they, they got germplasm from, from Asia, germplasm from Mexico, Central America, South America. And then that material was actually used, uh, specifically when this, some of, the, some of the material came from Asia, uh, with different sets of stress tolerances than maybe what we'd find in US germplasm. So that diversity of germplasm and the ability to select accurately with markers and do it at a scale lets you select hybrids that meet the needs of Southern Indiana uh, this one particularly, uh, very strong on southern rust. So I know down here some years you guys are going to get hit really, really hard for that. Probably starting to you know, see a little bit of it now. Um, but that's, that's, it's a product where southern rust resistance came in from a more set of diverse germplasm and allows us to know more about how that hybrid is going to perform. The other characteristics like root and stock strength, um, grain quality, complicated from a genetic standpoint. They're not like one or two genes that impact it. But now we can select more uh, thoughtfully in, in the beginning stages and make sure that the hybrid you have not only has things like southern rust, good grain quality, good standability, but also high yield. It's all about yield and, and the yield is, is the focus. So just one example. Um, no, and I'd be interested to hear folks who have grown that, um, you know, how that work out for you. Um, another, just another example, DeKalb 6595, 115 day, excellent heat and stress tolerance. So in addition to the U.S. germplasm, infusions of genes from, uh, from Central America and South America, obviously, a, you know, different, air, you know, you get in that hemisphere, really a lot of areas, very tough conditions, a lot hotter, um, sometimes more humid. 
Uh, but some of those genes came in and actually uh, contributed to some of the excellent stress tolerance that you see in 6595. Um, high yield across multiple environments. Um, nice looking hybrid. And that's just two examples. The other thing that we know you need is you don't need one hybrid, you don't need two hybrids. You need a portfolio of hybrids with different characteristics. And so our commitment to you folks is to keep driving that pipeline, making sure that we understand what your needs are, and running it at a scale that we can keep a full portfolio of products and meet the, the diversity needs that, that you need on your farm. Short stature corn, similar to what I was talking about on short stature wheat. Um, Bear Crop Science has a couple of, of approaches on this. One is a biotech approach, which is done in conjunction with BASF. And there's also a conventional breeding approach. And it's what it sounds like. It is short stature corn. So through about V6, V7, genes that, that have the short stature corn gene, the plants that have short stature corn genes will look very, very similar to um, the standard corn. But about V6, V7, the short stature corn, the inner nodes won't lengthen as much. And by the time you get to maturity, the corn will be a couple feet taller potentially than a hybrid that doesn't have those short stature genes in it. So um, not a dramatic change, but think back to the Borlaug example. Man won a Nobel Prize because part, one of the driving forces was actually short stature wheat. It's not the stature itself, but it's harvestable yield. So um, just as an example, yield loss, there's a Purdue study that shows yield loss due to stock uh, lodging can be 5 to 25 percent per year, depending on the year, depending on the hybrid. Root lodging can cause losses anywhere from 2 to 30 percent based on University of Wisconsin data. And then green snap, you know, depends on how much snaps, but yield losses out of green snap also can be significant. What something like short stature corn can do is, you know, you shorten it up, the ear height would still be the same, but you just less lodging um, and more harvestable yield. The other advantage uh, for something like short stature corn is just the ability to get in at this time of year. A couple feet makes a big difference. So if you need to get in with a ground rig, a couple feet shorter can allow us to manage inputs in a way that's different than maybe what we can do today. We all know we're under a lot of environmental pressure within the industry um, in a lot of different ways, including you know, how we manage our nitrogen and other nutrients. So I'm, in, I'm from Ohio, um, just outside of the, the Lake Erie watershed, but you know, when Toledo shut their water down, it was a pretty good wake up call for farmers in Ohio. We have to think about you know, how we're managing this so that we're, you know, we're stewarding things properly. Try to wrap up with um, a little bit about why, uh, first of all, thank you for buying the products that you buy, uh, the DeKalb products. Our commitment is to make sure that uh, those continue to provide excellent performance. And the reason why I'm confident of that is because it all starts with vision. So if you have a breeding program with a vision, um, you can be successful. This, I've talked about Dr. Crosby a lot, so I had the pleasure of uh, reporting in for a number of years. Uh, truly a visionary guy, and this is Dr. Borlaug right here. I think I mentioned, I don't know if I said it in this group, but Dr. Borlaug lived to over 100 years old. Um, if you don't know anything about him, look him up. Fascinating guy, uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize, and, and Ted had multiple opportunities actually to interact with him. And a lot of those same things that inspired, uh, that Dr. Borlaug did, inspired Ted Crosby, they inspired me, led to a whole, you know, it's fun for me to talk to some of the people just coming into plant breeding, and I'll ask them, why'd you go into plant breeding? Oh, I read about Norman Borlaug. I'm like, well, that's really cool, because, you know, that, was, that happened 60 years ago. Um, but it starts with vision. Part of that vision, the central part of the vision is yield. It was driven by, for one thing, diverse germplasm sources that provide access to disease resistance like four southern rust that maybe we didn't have in the, in the U.S. available to us before, diverse germplasm sources, the ability to manage that germplasm and make sure we understand what the genes are that we need and which ones that we don't. Um, teams of scientists, uh, not just br plant breeders, but plant geneticists, biochemists, plant pathologists, climate scientists, statisticians, all committed to developing products that meet your yield needs, but all the other agronomic, agronomic characteristics as well, and backed by a tremendous amount of, uh, of data that basically allows continuous learning and allows us to better predict next year based on year, and it, it, that'll just keep rolling. So the, the amount of data will keep continuing to increase in our understanding of it and ability to make decisions based on that will increase as well. So we're committed to bringing you folks the best products possible. Timer went off. Timing, the talk may have stunk, but the timing was pretty good. Um, so I, 
I don't think we're too, I, I think we do questions and they'll be around uh, at lunch as well, but any, any questions? Any questions for Bob? Are they doing any testing on that short corn if it shades out as well and gets as much sun into it for the photosynthesis? Um, well, if nothing else, it's going to be done indirectly because it, it theoretically should, um, it, it, the way we'll measure it ultimately, I'm sure they're doing specific measurements on it. The, the way you really measure whether or not you're getting it is through yield. And we will, you know, the, the, you guys aren't going to buy short stature corn because it's short if it's, you know, 10% off. So the ultimate measure will actually come out of a combine. Um, but it's like other, whenever we develop traits, there's a huge amount of science that goes into understanding all the other characteristics that are associated with that trait. And I, I, I don't know specifically on, on light interception, but yeah, I'm sure that uh, some of the scientists are looking at that as well. What about input, needs or costs? Yeah, I think that's all to be determined. So for example, you know, does it take the same amount of nitrogen for, I, I don't think we know the answer. I think you, know, you could make a case that it would be reduced. Um, but I think we have to, you know, it's a science company, we have to let the science drive it. But those are the kind of questions we have to answer before you can actually commercialize it. It's what does it do to inputs? Because there are always things that are somewhat more straightforward to predict than other things that, you know, you'll learn, you know, we'll learn it before we do. But yeah, I think it's a possibility that in inputs will, will change. Yes, sir. What's the time frame for when they cross that trait to where I can buy that bag of corn? Um, so a general answer would be from the time an initial cross is made with a trait until it could be commercialized. There are going to be nuances around whether it's biotech or not, uh, but in general it's going to take eight to ten years from a cross until a new trait comes out. If it's a biotech trait, you've got to factor in, you know, all the different uh, regulatory approvals that would be required, but it's going to, you know, it's going to be in the kind of decade range. Um, so that doesn't change much. Yes, right. It, some of the biotech timelines have actually been extended. It's one of the advantages of making sure you have conventional breeding approaches too because it doesn't require the, the regulatory input out of a conventional program. Yes, thank you. Yes. Does the, storage, uh, the short stature of corn, does it grow just as fast as a normal corn shape grows and everything? Yeah, the, like, so, yeah, go, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was going to rephrase it. But yeah, short corn is basically the growth habit the same. Again, nearly identical up through V6, V7. And then after that, I think in general, the, all of the other, the other agronomic development of the plant is going to have to line up pretty close to what we're doing on, on uh, the regular stature. Other questions? Okay. All right. I thank you for your time. Yep.